is this text called Thunder, Complete Mind. Just the title itself, Thunder, Complete Mind, or sometimes translated as Perfect Mind. That's Dzogchen. Dzogchen literally means the great perfection. So, very, very cool. Any questions about the Nag Hammadi stuff or any of that? And remember, these are uh, one of these that actually both of those that I brought up yesterday um, are considered revelations. So right now we go on this revelation of John is very, very violent and vengeful and actually has name calling and all kinds of stuff. And it's questionable whether John even wrote that book, but it gets used on both sides from the Civil War all the way to around the, the time of Christ when the war in Jerusalem was going on, they thought it was the end of the world. And several times thereafter, during the Civil War, they thought that was the end of the world. Abraham Lincoln actually cited Book of Revelations. <laughs> you know, so... This book that probably wasn't even written by John, if it was, it was ri written based on a vision that he had up in the mountains when he's very, very old, um, like impossibly old, actually, like must have been over 150 years old, according to scholars, for him to write that text. But. So to me, the violent name calling da, 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 is a little bit out of, and then the divisiveness. And the scholars suggest that the reason why this revelation became so popular was because there was a time where the Romans were destroying Jerusalem. And they thought God would come and save everybody. And, and this is the mentality. We see it everywhere. It's very, very popular. People think the world's going to end. In fact, every generation has a new reason why the world's going to end. I think now it's climate change or, or these wars. And it does very much seem biblical, the stuff that's going on, but also kind of staged, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, Either way, um, there's always this apocalyptic undertone that in the West it's endorsed. And think about how that has you leading your life. You're constantly in fear and you're constantly thinking the world is going to end. So there's an indifference there. Uh, all kinds of reasons why this is a bad idea. To and, and I encourage you all to look up all the people that predicted the end of the world. You got everybody in there from the popes to Charlie Manson to Louis Farrakhan to modern day churches that somehow are still going and people still follow them, even though they got it wrong. So this whole apocalyptic, the world's going to end thing, to me, is the greatest nonsense you could ever imagine. I think there's a reason why we're inclined towards it, maybe because we know we're going to die. So we, we, we're we going to have our own apocalypse, our own end of the world. <laughs> All of us are. And perhaps that's why we lean into this negative bias of a, apocalyptic thinking. But to me, it's... You can know that you're going to die. That's that's understanding impermanence. But the apocalyptic uh, thinking is more about your awakening, in my opinion. And the more I read the Gnostic texts, it really seems like that. That the world is going to end. Your delusional world. Yeah, you are going to die. Your ego is going to die. But what's left over is enlightenment, freedom. So that's um, that's an apocalypse to me, right? So either way, uh, I did mention this last session that the book of John, uh, John's revelations weren't even supposed to be included according to five other lists. It was the Archbishop of Egypt that decided, at least according to Elaine Pagels, uh, scholar from Stanford, the 
uh, many of those books weren't even supposed to be included or you know they were included based on the archbishop of egypt who had a list of the 27 books to be included to make the bible but there were other lists and now it's interesting enough elaine herself is she sort of has a list and it's much more egalitarian I also hear, uh, yes, she's saying, I also hear in the apocalyptic mindset, a kind of, fuck you for all the stupid life you've inflicted on, upon me. I've known people who want the end of the world. Well, they certainly want it. That's a good point. They they, they endure. I mean, you have these evangelicals, uh, these mega churches that are just preaching about it nonstop, you know, the end of the world, give me all your money. And it it really works well. It really, really works well. I can't imagine. It's it's pretty sad to me because look at what we had with um. Maybe I shouldn't even say his name. The guy that, you know, they killed all the the people with the Kool Aid, <laughs> right? And those were were just regular worshippers and practitioners that followed somebody thinking that the world was going to end, so they drank all this Kool-Aid and that was one of the biggest mass suicides in our recent history. It's unbelievable. And then they're forced to commit suicide when they didn't want to as well. So this is where all this uh, magical thinking and uh, religious extremism gets us. And here, for sure, I, I promote freedom of your own mind. To have freedom of your mind is, is a priority. Uh, to me, it's the most revolutionary thing you can do. And then you're also, by sharing some of these Gnostic texts, I hope that you'll travel with me to connect with our ancient lineage. Not just our direct lineage that we're a part of, this Palyol Nigma lineage, but we're a part of an ancient lineage, you know, of ascended practitioners, of practitioners conquering their mind, of practitioners practicing enlightenment. Yeah. And Jesus of Nazareth was most likely a Dzogchenpa. The more it looks like it, I didn't really know whether to believe in Jesus or not because of... Um, the historicity was highly questionable, but when I did my research, uh, it certainly appears that he was a yogi. And these so-called Gnostic texts, they're touching on the same thing we are. And in my opinion, Hermes was his too. Hermetics were ours too. Well, um, you were around for the text that we read 12 hours ago, right? Well, that's what, what he's practicing. If you read the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, well, those were attributed to Jesus' followers. And there are some, there are some passages that are, are attributed to him. Yeah, that's what's so amazing, right? They're most likely written around the time of Jesus. They're given credit in the, to the second or third century, but yeah. And that's why this is very interesting. I would look into Elaine uh, Pagels if you, if you want to see more. She has some great YouTube videos too. Uh, that's what makes this so interesting is that the revel the other books of revelations she has a book called revelations that that talks about the other revelations out there aside from this one very violent uh, book of revelation so there are other many other people there that were speaking for or from the teachings of jesus but you have the the roman governments here the Roman governance basically 
the Holy Roman Empire was supposed to be at all times considered heaven, the, the great kingdom. Um, and the, the Ho Holy Roman Emperor was considered of God, a child of God, you know, God's messenger, an extension of God, all kinds of stuff. So that's why so many yogis were killed, because they were a direct threat to the divinity of the Roman governance. And you saw this happening around the same time in uh, kingdoms in India as well, where tantrikas, where monastics were per persecuted as well. So something was going on, and something's been going on for couple thousand years now where they were just persecuting like crazy and anybody who's not part of the power structure of governance uh and if you, you know that's why even us as a group we're incredibly revolutionary if you consider history consider the persecution of Dzogchen Mahamudra in her tantras in her yogas you'll see how special we are and why I feel like I myself had to fight off some pretty dark forces to get here you know, and continue to keep my conduct pure, to keep my heart pure, because I'm I'm worried that it's a very sensitive time right now, um, where it's not, we're not just dealing with human persecution. I feel like it's an energetic sort of thing, you know. So, either way, maybe my mind has gotten a little bit more mystical lately, but. Yeah, it's just part of it, I guess. <laughs> so, Tashi asking, to Francis Tiso, he researched about resurrection and rainbow body. Uh, no, but I will look into it. Thank you. Uh, the thing is, there, I just keep, I know there's a lot of people doing this too being very silly about it but there really are there's really a, a common truth out there a sacred almost extraterrestrial out of this world sort of truth and when I hear meditation instructions and driving practices from Gnostic texts 2000 years ago I'm just gonna, okay So, anybody want to say anything else before we read a little bit of this text? I wanted to share it with the morning crew. Some of you had it. Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. And there's this, there's this overlay also. For example, if you ever look into the White Brotherhoods or the Universe of White Brotherhoods, um, we're talking about a raised organization here. We're talking about these uh, religions of light. There was an amalgamation called the Luminous Religion along the road where they actually had Jesus in full lotus. Again, if you're into history, religious history, look up the the link there, or the Luminous Religion. I forgot the title. But basically, they combined. I mean, I don't even know if that's the way it was because this is the old religion. Read their text. Wow. Jesus, you got to meditate. It's amazing. Totally amazing. And remember, around the time of the Britain, around the time of, of Jesus, um, they were systematically persecuting practitioners. Yeah, and so many go out into the mountains and practice safely that way, or try to practice safely. The Essenians and many other means, yeah. Did you find that luminous religion? The luminous, I'm not giving you enough information. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, do you have a, a, a sharing? If you, if you, don't let me uh, monopolize it. What is she in still? Oh, maybe that's the name. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Church, that's what I'm asking you to um, the text. Right? The Church of the East, also known as. Da -da 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 -da. Sorry, I'm just uh, looking at this real quick here. Huh. Interesting enough, the Church of the East monk Adam, uh, is Adam in Chinese, composed a text on the steel buried in 845. And we wouldn't even have Nag. Right now, this is happening. We see um, religious texts just being wiped out, practices being wiped out. Yeah. The Church of the East historically had a presence in China during two periods. First, from the 7th century through the 10th century in the Tang Dynasty, when it was known as Jingzhou, the Luminous Religion. So it wasn't considered a church. It's called the Luminous Religion. And sure enough, you, I encourage you all to look at this. There's a stupa, also known as a stupa, which is part of a church. All right? These are typically classified as Buddhists. So I think uh, Western academia does this really no good by constantly separating these into different religions when really it's looking like we had one curriculum that just had a wide range, you know, senior year. And people conflated. This. They were like, oh, this is, uh, this is Nama because we're doing breath meditation and you're doing guru yoga, so you must not be a righteous you must be buddhist and i must be christian because i'm sitting in silence and you're doing guru yoga no perhaps you're on different stages of the path you ever think of that so instead we have this huge division going on uh right now which is typical of degenerate times i would say so it's not to be too surprising but i want <clears throat> And why are we focused on a proprietary thing? I think it be cohesion. If you can, that's Jesus Christ sitting in meditation. Very cool. Yeah. The luminous religion of Dakin, Dakin being the Chinese language term for the Roman Empire in the first and second centuries. <laughs> it's amazing how things tie together. 
Well, considering we're at the top of the hour, yeah, look at that. Well, it's Jesus, according to them, that was their statue. They also have stupas on that same page and many other illustrations, if you're not convinced. Yeah, interestingly enough, he's sitting on top of the cross, not hanging from it. And the cross looks much more traditional, but anyway. Yes, Jetson. Yes. I mean, all the the naming these religions and, and trying to divide them into different religions, I don't know if that's useful. For me, it's much more useful that these are just names for the same sort of approach, the same curriculum, you know, but The curriculum is so large that it's difficult to, to draw correlations. Right. Right, Tashi. Yeah. And so some of you who, who may have some post-traumatic stress from Christianity or... I, I think this is a great chance for us to... To make some, yeah, <laughs> but th this is a, a chance for us to make some peace here, yeah, or Islam, right? And through drawing some correlations and, and tying things together from way back in the day, then I think you can create some peace with your path, too. So, anyway, maybe we could read a little tiny bit. We have a I think uh, we're going to close up in about 10 minutes, but uh, yes, you would you mind terribly uh, reading from the trimorphic protonoia? All right. And I know we went into it uh, a little bit, so maybe find a good place where it was. I get very excited. You guys will see me get excited when it, we're talking history. I love history. Sledge. Ledge. Okay. Okay, you should go read now. <laughs> that would be cool if we had all our all the books that we've read in here on a list on the website, huh? I should talk to Emma about that. Yeah, that would be pretty amazing, Jetson. <laughs> I might have to... Oh, you have them collected already. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that again. Uh I'm probably going to be stuck on the Nag Hammadi all day today. <laughs> but please, uh, let's hear a little bit of this. And something to keep in mind is that the Nag Hammadi is just a collection of texts, okay? Uh, so they, they're not grouped together based on anything, except for the fact that at the time, people were being told to burn all books. And so instead of burning them, they put them in a jar. They were discovered on a very rough uh, cliffside, the farmer, I believe, 
if I remember correctly, had used some of the text for tea to make tea. Um, so some of them were fragmented. And then also, yeah, well, he was a very poor farmer. I forget his name now, the one who discovered, but um, the location, uh, I'm pretty sure, was called Nagamadi. It's named after the location where it was found. And then... Uh, you know, it ranges from Plato's Republic to you have sort of Dharma texts that were found in there. But all Dharma texts were, were being incinerated as well at the time. Um, anything that took divinity away from the Romans, the Roman governance uh, was being torched. So reading from tri Trimorphic Protenoia. Trimorphic Protenoia. Probably Greek. I am Protenoia, the thought that dwells in the light. I am the movement that dwells in the all. He in whom the all takes its stand the firstborn among those who came to be, she who exists before the all. She, Protenoia, is called by three names although she dwells alone, since she is perfect. I am invisible within the thought of the invisible one. I am revealed in the immeasurable, ineffable things. I am incomprehensible, dwelling in the incomprehensible. I move in every creature. I am the life of my epinoia that dwells within every power and every eternal movement and in invisible lights and within the archons and angels and demons and every soul dwelling in Tartarus and in every material soul. I dwell in those who came to be. I move in everyone and I delve into them all. I walk uprightly and those who sleep I awaken, and I am the sight of those who dwell in sleep. I am the invisible one within the all. It is I who counsel those who are hidden, since I know the all that exists in it. I am numberless beyond everyone. I am immeasurable ineffable, yet whenever I wish I shall reveal myself of my own accord. I am the head of the all. I exist before the all, and I am the all, since I exist in everyone. I am a voice speaking softly. I exist from the first, I dwell within the silence that surrounds every one of them, and it is the hidden voice that dwells within me, within the incomprehensible, immeasurable thought, within the immeasurable silence. I descended to the midst of the underworld, and I shone upon the darkness. It is I who poured forth the water. It is I who am hidden within radiant waters. I am the one who gradually put forth the all by my thought. It is I who am laden with the voice. It is through me that Gnosis comes forth. I dwell in the ineffable and unknowable ones. I am 
perception and knowledge, uttering a voice by means of thought. I am the real voice. I cry out in everyone, and they recognize it, the voice, since a seat involves them. I am the thought of the Father, and through me proceeded the voice, that is, the knowledge of the everlasting things. I exist as thought for the all, being joined to the unknowable and incomprehensible thought. I revealed myself, yes, I, among all those who recognize me, for it is I who am joined with everyone by virtue of the hidden thought and an exalted voice, even a voice from the invisible thought. And it is immeasurable, since it dwells in the immeasurable one. It is a mystery. It is unrestrainable by the incomprehensible one. It is invisible to all those who are visible in the all. It is a light dwelling in light. It is also who alone have separated from the visible world, since we are saved by the hidden wisdom by means of the ineffable, immeasurable voice. And he who is hidden within us pays the tributes of his fruit to the water of life. Then the Son, who is perfect in every respect, that is, the world who originated through that voice, who proceeded from the height, who has within him the name, who is a light. He, the Son, revealed the everlasting things, and all the unknowns were known. And those things difficult to interpret in secret, he revealed, and as for those who dwell in silence with the first thought, he preached to them, and he revealed himself to those who dwell in darkness, and he showed himself to those who dwell in the abyss, and to those who dwell in the hidden treasuries, he told ineffable mysteries, and he taught unrepeatable doctrines to all those who became sons of the light. Okay, no. it, for some of you, uh, you may be able to see the three kayas here, Dharma Kaya, Samboka Kaya, and Ramana Kaya. And also, when they talk about thought, you can plug in the just cognizance. So, from the, from the cognizant, the first cognizance, that mysterious, ineffable thought, uh, I'm pretty sure cognizance would have been a better translation. Interestingly enough, another text in the Nakamadi talks about the word incognizance in the Gospel of Thomas. They talk about this idea of incognizance, free of conceptual elaboration, just like we, we speak about now. And my guess is that many of the um, Caesar himself probably did not understand and definitely did not understand the nuances of what's being talked about here. And so there's always an outer, inner, and secret when it comes to Dharma. Nowadays, we don't even acknowledge those three levels of understanding. We typically will go on one or the other. And secret is completely disregarded. And we'll usually just go on the outer. Like, oh, Virgin Mary, she it must have been a woman who magically was impregnated. Well, instead of saying metaphorically, you might actually think that they're talking about a woman who is magically impregnated. But if you look at it, like Dharmakaya, then it starts to make a lot more sense and it logically ties together perfectly without needing the magical thinking. So if you can tie in the three um, kayas into this and, and empty cognizance, I encourage you to do it because it's taught it's one thing right now. And please, if you feel like challenging it, uh, debating it, I am totally open to that. But um, 
Don't force yourself, okay? So let's hear a little bit more. Now, the voice that originated from my thought exists as three permanences. The father, the mother, the son. Existing perceptibly as speech, it voice has within it a word endowed with every glory, and it has three masculinities, three powers, and three names. They exist in the manner of three, which are quadrangles, secretly within a silence of the ineffable one. It is he alone who came to be, that is, the Christ. And as for me, I anointed him as the glory of the invisible spirit with goodness. Now, the three I established alone in eternal glory over the eons in the living water, that is, the glory that surrounds him who first came forth to the light of those exalted eons, and it is in glorious light that he firmly perseveres, and he stood in his own light that surrounds him, that is, the eye of the light that gloriously shines on me. He perpetuated the father of all the eons. Who am I? The thought of the father, Protenoia, that is, Barbello, the perfect glory and the immeasurable invisible one who is hidden. I am the image of the invisible spirit, and it is through me that the all took shape, and I am the mother as well as the light, which she appointed as virgin, she who is called Merothea, the incomprehensible womb, the unrestrainable and immeasurable voice. Then the perfect son revealed himself to his eons who originated through him, and he revealed them and glorified them and gave them thrones and stood in the glory which he glorified himself. They blessed the perfect Son, the Christ, the only begotten God, and they gave glory, saying, He is, He is, the Son of God, the Son of God. It is He who is, the eons of eons beholding the eons which He begot. For Thou hast begotten by Thine own desire. Therefore we glorify Thee, ma mu o o o e a e on e the eon of eons, the eon which he gave. Then, uh, it, you know, I know it, it might be tricky for some people to decode this, but we have the exact same thing in in our Palio lineage, which is uh, very ancient and, and unbroken for thousands of years. Um, we have a e e u u ri ri li li e e o o am a ka 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 nya ta 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 nya ta 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 nya ta 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 nya pa 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 ma ya ro la wa sha ka sa ha kya o mi da ma hit da ba o hit da kin da ta da ka ha da yo ri na wa i wa am ba di ma ha shu ma na ye so ha this is the extended version of what you just saw it, it's it's called purifying the speech and you have it right there in this ancient text if you look at the um emptiness sutras that's where the, our vocabulary was actually introduced the in the prajaparamita they have this uh ancient <clears throat> alphabet they call it right the om arabajanati that uh <clears throat> manjushri's alphabet so th that's essentially what we're talking about here uh it, it's like a purification of the speech happening and unless you Unless you're plugged into a, luckily plugged into an ancient Dharma lineage, 
uh, you may not even see that. It may be very random, but thank you to the translators who included it nonetheless. But here you can also find a reasonable explanation for how Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, these are texts coming from people that actually practiced with him, allegedly, right? So that would be like uh, hearing from, I don't know, uh, you know, from Ananda, you know, or, or somebody that was close to Buddha Shakyamuni, just able to to hear what it was like, right? And, and people try to, they try to tell us, oh, this is what Jesus meant. This is what Jesus said, you know, and really we have the Roman Empire defining religion for us. And to me, I, I invite you to use these types of texts to redefine it for yourself, you know. So how are we feeling? Any comments, questions? It's Sunday. I'm up for reading a little bit more of this. <laughs> yes, you still feel like reading? Maybe a little bit more because this is very interesting to me and I hope it is to everybody else. Um, let me answer Dundrup's question. The Virgin Mary, remember how I talked about your mind was like a womb? Just like when you go to sleep... There's your cognizance has infinite potential in the sense of a womb, right? So that's the Virgin Mary. All of a sudden, your thoughts impregnate this womb, and you have a child, which is your dream. That's why when you're, if anybody's decoding this text as Yeshu reads it, whenever they talk about child, try to plug in reality. That's reality is the child of our mind. Uh, the father is our cognizance. The mom is the space, the basic space. Does that make sense, don't you? <clears throat> exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. In the same way, um, the Virgin Mary gave birth to you. Your mind, your, your womb-like mind has birthed you and now you're a child of god in a sense that you're a child of your unconditioned pure mind see how it, yeah see how it all of a sudden becomes accessible all of a sudden it becomes logical things add up rather than the traditional biblical understanding or even islamic understanding <laughs> we're, we're uh, the, the traditional understandings are going to give you mostly the outer and they tie in some of the inner stuff, but definitely not the, the secret ultimate meaning. They don't give you that really. <clears throat> and I think that's part of a systematic power stru structure that really seeks to disempower people, uh, judging by the historicity. But yes, certainly that's the whole point right there, Dundrup, is that you you are Christ. Yeah, you are that Christ consciousness and exactly the same as Jesus. Of course, you have your mind. Jesus had their own mind, but in the end, uh, without our attached meanings and labels, you are the pure mind light, the luminosity. You know, you're... There's always three stages, just like a light bulb has three stages. A light bulb has the light bulb itself, which is the home for the light. That's the Dhammakaya. That's the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> then the electricity is the power. That's the cognizance. So this power, this cognizance, which we're hearing about in this text right now, that power gives birth to light. It births light. So here we can think of the light bulb itself as the Dharmakaya, the electricity as the Sambhokakaya, and the luminosity as the Nirmanakaya. The luminosity, the light from the light bulb, is the display. Understand? Yeah, so just like that, we can think about it more scientifically or more, you know, appetizing to, to our modern minds. 
uh, we can think and start to see that through Dzogchen, we begin to really work with the light and the mind itself and, and understanding how our mind creates dreams, understanding using modern science as well, uh, how our mind creates this reality. And by the way, I was floored last night. I'm somewhat addicted to these texts right now. They actually mention the five colors in the Gospel of Thomas. They mention the five colors. <laughs> so my guess is this entire curriculum has been around not just for Dharma practitioners, but was circulating to, to a great extent. And in this sense, that's why in Dharma, they say that you can pray to your sort of uh, Dharmakaya mind. Uh, in some traditions, they call it the true self because this is your true mind. But I think it takes away from ineffability a little bit when we label it too hard. Yeah, I will pray, you know, every now and then I do pray. Like today, I'm going to pray that I get some dog food. <laughs> but I do pray sometimes, uh, you know, but mostly I've never been a big prayer. For some reason, it's just I'd rather align my heart with this, you know, ineffability which can be called God, you know, it is like that. It's way larger, way more powerful than our thinking mind. So when we come into this nature of mind in Dzogchen, we're accessing something that can be very godlike. Uh, and I think when people talk about God, that's exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about your mind. And and people try to insinuate that there's another creator out there, but I have yet to see anything in this world that my mind did not create. I can witness my mind creating. So why would I attribute, especially the bad things, the so-called suffering, why would I attribute any of that to an external God when I can see how my mind's making it? So if my mind's, if I can see how my mind's making this reality, well, what is God making then? Well, God is pure virtue, right? Well, God's not making anything. <laughs> God just, you have the the free will to create. And it's not really free will until you master your mind. Up until that point, you're more or less in the eggshells of your mind. Any other uh, comments, questions? All right. Well, let's read a little bit more. <clears throat> Thank you all for those who are entertaining this. It's very, very powerful stuff. You're connecting to something very powerful, part of our history here. And... No, I know we talk about timelessness and things like that, but even in a timeless way, you can connect to this. Then, moreover, the God who has begotten gave them the eons, a power of life on which they might rely, and he established them. The first eon he established over the first. Armedon, Nosanius, Armosel. The second he established over the second eon. Phaeonius, Aenius, 
Oro Yayo. The third, over the third, Ion, Melath, Paneos, Loyos, Devaitai. The fourth, over the fourth, Mosanius, Amethes, Elepeth. Now those eons were begotten by the God who has begotten the Christ, and these eons received as well as gave glory. They were the first to appear, exalted in their thoughts, and each eon gave myriads of glories within great untraceable lights, and they all together blessed the perfect Son, the God who was begotten. Then there came forth a word from the great light, Eleleth, and said, I am King. Who belongs to chaos and who belongs to the underworld? And at that instant his light appeared radiant, endowed with the epinoia. The powers of the powers did not entreat him, and likewise immediately there appeared the great demon who rules over the lowest part of the underworld and chaos. He was neither form no perfection, but on the contrary possesses the form of the glory of those begotten in the darkness. Now, he is called Saklas, that is, Samael, Yaltabaoth, he who had taken power, who had snatched it away from the innocent one, Sophia, who had earlier overpowered her, who is the light's epinoia, Sophia, who had descended, her from whom he, Yaltaboath, had come forth originally. Now, when the epinoia of the light realized that he had begged him, the light, for another order, even though he was lower than she, she said, Grant me another order, so that you may become for me a dwelling place, lest I dwell in the sword forever. And the order of the entire house of glory was agreed upon her word. A blessing was brought for her, and the higher order released it to her. And the great demon began to produce eons in the likeness of the real eons, except that he produced them out of his own power. Then I too revealed my voice secretly, saying, Cease, desist you who tr tread on matter, for behold, I am coming down to the world of mortals for the sake of my portion that was in that place from the time when the innocent Sophia was conquered, she who descended, so that I might thwart their aim which the one revealed by her appoints. And all were disturbed each one who dwells in the house of the ignorant light, and the abyss trembled, and the archigenitor of ignorance reigned over chaos and the underworld, and produced a man in my likeness. But he neither knew that that one would become for him a sentence of dissolution, nor does he recognize the power in him. Okay, so that that was basically, a, a, you know, a very proprietary sort of a description of how all this got started. They they plug in nomenclature that they basically have at the time. So words and vocabulary that they have at the time. And if you can somehow read through that and decipher it a little bit, it becomes interesting. But I know that's very tricky. That's what they call twilight language. In my opinion, there's a lot of twilight language here, but also words that simply we don't use anymore. 
but it's always it's always the same ignorance gives birth to this sort of world you know of uh confusion and it's the mind itself that that gives this birth so very interesting in that regard uh, i know it can get a little heavy on the terminology and i want things to always be accessible in here so Please, anything that you're interested in, go read on your own and, and get into it. It can be very cool.